So, um, I mean, most of you know me, but I think uh, maybe just very shortly, my name is uh, Edita Just, and I'm Associate Professor. I worked uh, recently at the um, Department of Thematic Studies at Linköping University in Sweden. And basically, all my life, I'm kind of committed to interdisciplinary research. So, Adurna, you made that point about being literary, and I am, because I'm combining <laughs> kind of like different disciplines uh, basically i'm using academic and creative writing also this is also what i'm teaching to kind of like produce daring epistemologies uh, sometimes it works sometimes it's challenging you know but nonetheless uh, this is what i'm committed to because i think that when you bring many things together you can really make a nice resonance and so eventually really produce something interesting um, and also, so that's like my short introduction. I could talk a lot, but the time is limited. But first of all, I would like to really thank you very, very much to um, the Usto International Tuning Academy, the director and the crew, for giving me this great opportunity to be here for five weeks, uh, four weeks, but I, I like it so much, so I'm staying one week longer to get to know you uh, because it's, uh, it's it's a pleasure and also you're so kind warm and supportive so uh, thank you very much for this and also for the opportunity of course of doing my research and of doing my research welcome of doing my research and uh, sharing now my research with you so thank you very very much uh, very much appreciate it um, so what I would like to do today is, um, I guess that uh, the, the, the article that I actually managed to finish here, um, it's pretty complex, I would say, and very interdisciplinary. And uh, I would like to go really into the details, but given the time, um, well, I think I will just like focus on the most important points. And then, you know, later on, if you're interested, you can read it and uh, we can also have a discussion if you have uh, questions, but um, uh, nonetheless, uh, I will try to kind of like squeeze in the complexity into 30 minutes, uh, more or less. So um, basically, uh, what is really important for me, uh, since some time already are generic competences, and it actually all started with the tuning in 2010, when I did uh, together with the Usto and the um, uh, Tuning Academy, uh, the tuning brochure on gender studies programs uh, in Europe. And that was the moment when I really got uh, very interested in uh, generic competences. And of course, you know, the list is pretty long. It's around 31, I think, defined by the European Union. And I've already written articles. Mm -hmm. And I've already written articles about those generic competences <clears throat> and teaching in the uh, normal face-to-face -face, uh, classrooms. What how we can approach it and recently i'm also working on edited volume on generic competences that should be out next year 2017 with cambridge scholars publishers uh, but nonetheless this article and this particular focus is on online education so it's something new also for me so that's why i'm also very open to feedback comments and and questions because uh, the online environment differs to me significantly from the face-to-face -face in certain aspects so, and in this uh, article, and as such, by extension, this presentation, I'm basically focusing on criticism <laughs> and creativity, because um, this uh, competence, apart from the others, is very appealing to me. And of course, I find others also very interesting, but of course, I cannot cover them all in just one article and one presentation. So. Um, and again, uh, I will just be giving like those snapshots that you will see. And, and again, uh, it's in the article is all more explained and elaborated. And I can also do it a bit later if we have time for it. So basically for me, criticism and creativity come together. And it's this uh, ability to basically problematize uh, the meaning. So I combine it with thinking about meaning making processes. So for me, it's this ability to, to, to to become surprised, basically, to suddenly feel the lack of meaning in anything that we encounter in the external you know, sensations or internal sensations, but also the ability to uh, 
um, create, as I call it, generate, conjure a new meaning. And at the same time, I see the meaning making practice as uh, on those three levels, on the level of thinking, feeling and doing. So thinking, feeling and acting differently. And uh, that the meaning never stops being produced so that the meaning is constantly generated when you think about criticism, when you think about creativity. So the biggest question is, of course, what kind of pedagogical practices to use? And then, uh, well, how to actualize those practices in the online context? So in this presentation, um, there are two theories <coughs> that actually really influence my way um, inspire me to think about criticism and creativity but also they influence uh, my way of thinking about pedagogical practices. So on one hand, thinking what it means, criticism, creativity. On the other hand, thinking then how they can be uh, actualized. I mean, like what kind of pedagogical practices? So there are two theories that I will very shortly speak about <coughs> that influence my ways of, uh, uh, of thinking about it. And at the same time, I make like kind of theoretical experiments. So I try to combine those two theories. One is neuroscientific theory, one is philosophical theory. So um, that when they come together, what kind of knowledge I have and then how I can use that knowledge to promote certain pedagogical practices. So that's one part. And then another part is how then I can think about actualizing those practices online and how can we use online environment to actually uh, actualize or materialize those pedagogical practices so that ultimately we can promote criticism and creativity among students. And again, I do apologize because um, it took me a really long time to kind of like nail down uh, this neuroscientific theory because as you can imagine, neuroscientific language differs significantly from language of humanities. <coughs> So what they understand uh, sometimes about certain concepts or words is not necessarily resonating with our meaning, speaking about meaning making. But nonetheless, uh, this is the theory I'm working with. I already published on it. Uh, it's a psychological construction is account of the brain basis of emotion or the conceptual act model. So very shortly, you can read it, but I usually don't read my slides. So uh, basically, the thing is that all of us have conceptual knowledge. The conceptual knowledge is our experience. And the conceptual knowledge is developed, um, how, how to put it, like in different modalities. So basically, um, just to nail it down for us, so if, if we think about the sea, we not only remember the sea, we don't see the sea, but we can also remember what to do at the sea, how you felt at the sea. So that's why when you go to the sea, you more or less know what to do. You go closer to the, to the water, but when it's you know winter, you will not maybe necessarily jump and swim there. So basically that meaning that you have associated, you know, is this big conceptual knowledge about the sea, what you do, how you feel, and what you think. And the same thing, my favorite, famous uh, example is spider. I'm arachnophobic, so every time spiders comes up, I immediately know what to do. Either I, I'm sorry, I just do something that maybe I shouldn't. Maybe you have the wrong concept of spider. <laughs> Precisely! <laughs> point, Ivan, exactly. That, that's my point about criticism and creativity. So that's the conceptual knowledge. Certain interactions, you know what I mean? When you have a pain, it's an internal sensation of your tooth. You kind of like know what to do, right? You take ibuprofen and paracetamol, that's the conceptual knowledge. And this is something that I want to challenge when we think about criticism and creativity. So basically we have that knowledge, so we know what to do, how to think, how to feel. It's usually automatic, sometimes could be volitional, but usually it's automatic. <laughs> developed for different external internal sensations. But the whole point is, and there is a hope that this conceptual knowledge can change. But at the same time, the conceptual knowledge can almost like overshadow what we see. So my whole point about the critic, you know, like it is, it is the night and there is somebody walking behind you. So it's almost like immediately your conceptual knowledge tells you what to do, even if when you turn and it could be maybe just a dog or, or an older person walking. But you know, it's also, this is this kind of, you know, how the conceptual knowledge can kind of influence almost, you know, what you see. 
sorry, is it also connected to stereotypes or stereotypical yes. impressions? That yeah, it's all because it all depends uh, even precisely like how this conceptual knowledge was was created. So basically, um, like in a nutshell, because it's it's more complex. It's as you can imagine, you know, pages written about this theory. But since I don't have time, you know, so 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 this is something like that but at the same time you know that this conceptual knowledge can be challenged so it can be changed but what is also crucial is that the <laughs> cognition and affectivity come together so you cannot draw a clean line between feeling and doing it all comes together and then i work with the uh, philosophical concepts of the Luz and guattari and again i'm not doing justice here to the complex scholarship but um i'm basically well i could call myself the Delusian Guattarian philosopher. But in this sense, what I'm doing with this is uh, like three major concepts, affect, concept, and stratum. So basically, and of course about affect, you probably know affective term, million things written, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the way I work mm -hmm. with affect here, it's from Thousand Plateau and what is philosophy, is basically for me, and again, just nailing it down, a moment of surprise a moment of wonder when you don't take things for granted. So um, usually uh, certain things or feelings or actions go automatic. But can we have the moment of suspension? Can we have the moment when, the, when, when there is no meaning, when what you feel and think is a surprise, is a nonsense, basically? And then the concept is the new kind of uh, meaning is a new kind of sense that gets produced. And for the Luz and Guattari, especially in what is philosophy, you need the moment of surprise, of wonder, of an ape, especially like, for example, when you have interaction with art, in order to produce new meaning, in order to really challenge your conceptual frameworks that you have given certain external or internal stations. But stratum is something interesting because stratum is more like this uh, customary habitual meaning. And in a sense, you would say, why do we need stratum? Because then it means that we cannot be affected, that we will not be surprised or we will not lose a meaning of something, you know, because the whole idea is to see, feel, think and act differently. But at the same time, too much affectivity too much of new meaning, uh, as my students are saying, is too much to take. I cannot take it. So in this sense, you know, for me, it's also important to think like then how into the lack of meaning and new meaning, we can still incorporate the habitual so that uh, because this is also what the Luz and Guattari say, too much indetermination, too much of novelty, you know, maybe cannot kill you, but nonetheless, can become unproductive eventually, because as I said, it's too much to take. So basically in my theoretical experiment, I'm combining those two theories. So I'm combining the neuroscientific theory together with those with the Delusian uh, and Guattarian uh, concepts. And again, it's more elaborated than I can do it right now. But the point is that for me then, you know, like experimenting with this and having hypotheses is basically okay. So the, so the brain, when you try to combine those two theories, the brain and by extension the embodied subject can be surprised. So we can challenge our meaning. And the thing is that especially now, when you think what is happening in Europe and worldwide, <coughs> you think that you know new ways of thinking, feeling and acting are absolutely necessary. Especially, um, I'm very committed to those of uh, also being an activist uh, to kind of, respect for difference and diversity and i think that especially now when you look about you know what's happening what is happening with the rise of racist uh, homophobic behaviors etc cetera, etc cetera. recently in poland we had a case again a black man was attacked just because he's black you know because poland is becoming extremely racist and fascist i would say even so uh, so though i cannot even imagine how poland can become fascist knowing the history in 39 but nonetheless uh, so so the thing for me is like okay so there is a hope the brain and the embedded and embodied subject can think differently and can produce a new meaning 
And of course, you know, you can say, well, we all know it, but you know, the moment you make it like theoretically stronger, it can really influence very good practices because, well, this is also what we do as academics. We do produce theory, but I don't want those theories to go to vain. Those theories should work. So, so for me, practical implications are very important. So, but what is important for me by combining those two, two theories is precisely like, hey, so we can produce new meaning, but very important that we can produce it on the level of thinking, feeling and acting. But at the same time, for me, this affect, this moment of lack of meaning is very important. And this is how I work with my students, trying to put it into practice so that, because the point is, not even what you think, but that the meaning will be fluctuating, that the meaning is always postponed. It's a bit like Jacques Derrida, you know, and the deferral, so the constant deferral of meaning. But at the same time, of course, we need to have epistemic rest. What I call epistemic rest, well, the moment that, you know, you produce, of course, certain meaning, but it's more like a snapshot. It's something that is right now necessary, but you know it's never finished when it comes to, uh, uh, well, when it, when, it, when it comes to different uh, phenomena. So for me, what is crucial is that not only I will try to, you know, uh, evoke this new meaning, but at the same time that I will play with affect and concept. What I mean is like, you know, that the lack of meaning, the surprise, the wonder will produce a new meaning. And this affect and concept you know, will be together intertwined so that the meaning can continue. And of course you can have, and I also admit that, that there are million theories of meaning making, affectivity, unconscious, volition, automatic, but you know, my part in it is my contribution uh, to the discussion. <coughs> and since meaning is in the making, in two years time, maybe I will rewrite that article or basically have a sequel and something else will pop up because this is also how I see knowledge production and, and epistemology. So then, um, oh, sorry. So then when I combine those two theories, what happens for pedagogical practices? So for me, in this sense, I'm a bit, and forgive me for that, um, um, against neoliberal belief, yes, we can, because sometimes no, we cannot. So in a way, uh, first of all, I think that, of course, that when you have your students, we also need to admit that because you know this conceptual knowledge is so strong, not always you will be able to challenge the conceptual frameworks. You will find the opposition, and I'm not saying to give up and cry in the corner, but this is also something to keep in mind that, you know, and I'm also not saying that I'm a, you know, a puppet master and now I want to play with everybody's mind. It's kind of like presenting the plethora of option, hoping, you know, uh, something can be chosen, but not putting into the minds, you know, what needs to be done. So basically it's more like presenting, giving an option, affecting and producing new meaning, but not the only one that I think is, is okay, right? So it's more like any time I re teach theory, I never teach one, but then another one or another one so that they can kind of like have a cartography a map, but how they go, well, it's up to you basically, okay? Uh, you need to have your own GPS and maybe not necessarily the one that it's set for you. Even GPS shows you three roads to the point, you see? So um, there is a bit of creativity even there. So nonetheless, uh, so for me, those practices, first of all, should try to generate new meaning of different internal and external sensations. Really pay attention that the feeling, thinking, and acting are absolutely intertwined together. But at the same time, trying to produce those moments of surprise, those moments of wonders that can initiate new ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. And then by intertwining, but combining the affect and concept, the new meaning, and then the off again, you know, push the meaning ad infinitum so that eventually the students will also not take things for granted. So, and I've, I'm not, you know, outside of culture. I also have my automatic reactions. But once you know about it and once you can reflect on it, you know, you're already halfway, uh, well, successful, I would <laughs> say, in the meaning making uh, processes. So, and again, I would love to talk much more about this neuroscientific theory, the Deleuze, and, and then the implications for pedagogical practices, but as always, time is against me. 
So, uh, or maybe I should challenge the meaning of that. <laughs> <laughs> you see? Okay, so to the time. So it's not that because it's already half past two on that one, you see? It's a uh, past one. I know, dear, this one is not changed. So let's clear, let's clear the time a bit, you know, and problematize the time meaning making thingy. Okay, so then I was thinking, okay, so what to do, what to do in a classroom is a bit easier uh, because uh, there are different kind of teaching methods, learning activities, but I'm also teaching online. And um, well, I would really like to kind of like boost it a bit more because um, when you read about different ways of teaching online, then you have those amazing technologies will still, which still, however, do not really find a way to universities. They do, but to military services or really very rich um, medical, they use like the um, virtual reality in medical schools, but really like, you know, the top schools, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, shortly because uh, oh, 10 minutes um, so i was thinking about two things and those are initial thoughts so this is also something so so well now i want to think how i can actualize the practices that i was talking to you about uh, online um, this article becomes an invitation to to further thinking and further problematizing also, I don't want to give all the final answers because then uh, I'm actually opposing my own theories that the meaning making, you know what I mean, it's not something that should be collectively produced and, um, well, in the making in a way. So I was thinking about um, immersion. And how I problematize immersion is because already, and again, there will be like, I will try to be short. I mean, first of all, screen does work. Uh, does produce a sense of immersion. Uh, first of all, because it is a kind of uh, a rabbit hole, you know, and I will be now referring a lot to the, this is the literary <laughs> part, uh, Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll, <laughs> here it comes. Um, and at the same time, it has this, a lot has been written about it, that it has this ability to kind of like, you know, frame your perception. So it's really like becoming this framing force. But again, this is not enough. So basically, uh, following some neuroscientific theories, Dean Burnett, for example, uh, curiosity is the key to stay focused and attentive. But for me, curiosity is not enough. So then uh, for me, it also should be self-curiosity because anytime I want my student to produce a knowledge or to do something or to get involved in any kind of task, the student is in it. And quite often, you know, in different, uh, academic disciplines you have this like this is my work this is my job and i'm like i'm like not attached to it you know, you know what i mean and for me it needs to come together it's almost like you need to be self-reflective so this is also you know following the vein of the you know the whole post-structuralism post-modernist thinking you know that you do in a way matter in your knowledge production and also now recently the new materialism that it's uh, popping up so for me immersion when it comes to cyberspace, why it's, so, well, why it's easier? Because cyberspace gives us those tools to create, you know, uh, speed of change, twists and turns, things that we cannot really experience or imagine in real life. Because you cannot suddenly fly, right? Or you cannot have all those changes. And I do believe that when you have the landscapes that are very interactive, as I put, unfamiliar, diverse, with twists and turns, and lots of interactions. You can have really engagement, attention, and sort of curiosity evoke. And for me, this is crucial to make students wonder, to produce new meaning, and to kind of like go on and, you know, knowing that you need an epistemic rest, you need to produce something, but at the same time that it's never final. It's a kind of like a corridor. You choose one room, but there are more rooms to open, you know? Every time I talk about this, speaking about meaning making, I see Jack Nicholson and Shining. I'm sorry, it always comes to my mind, you know, when I see this corridor with those million doors and what it tells you. So uh, can then we, with our practices, when it comes to software, hardware, teaching methods, learning activities and content, can we create immersion? And this is my plea, and this is my kind of invitation to thinking together. But it's not only that, but it's also to always mind students and durability and sustainability. 
because as I said, too much indetermination, too much of novelty could be maybe too much to take. And I've seen and I've experienced that when sometimes students are running off the room because uh, especially when you teach philosophy, it touches uh, uh, well very deep structures of you know subjectivity, embodiment, etc. So that's one thing. But at the same time, also trying to map students' patterns of conceptualization. So you know, like knowing, you know, uh, and predicting in a way. And you know, this is this whole discussion. Of course, you cannot have individual forms of teaching. So in a one hand, right, you always need somehow to. I don't want to use the word homogenize, but in a way, yes, because you cannot teach separately. But nonetheless, the online gives us those possibilities. And it's a lot of talking now about effective computing, but oh well, I will not now be, be talking about it. So for me, especially this, this last part then is important. So can we create immersion? Can we create those moments of up, of transformations, <laughs> etc., that will help students indeed to be surprised, to wonder, to, to produce new meaning, but at the same time feel and, and act and, um, well, think differently. And in a sense, um, you know, so I wouldn't be myself if I don't use certain forms of literary work. So basically for me, and this is like a teaser, of course, so can we think about Wonderland? I mean, it's absolutely for me, uh, Lois Carroll, um, uh, and Alice in Wonderland, of course, it's, it's called as a book for children, but no, I mean, for me, it's a perfect, it's, it's beautiful Giridian book, actually, for me, when the meaning is absolutely played up with, when you read it, I mean, um, and how, I mean, he himself is, uh, was mathematician, you know, playing with logics, etc. So in this sense, it's not surprising that it's there, but nonetheless, uh, and I will not be reading it to you, but, um, but I, but, but when I'm, when I was thinking about it, like, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that all the physicists should create Wonderland as it is in Alice in Wonderland, but nonetheless, when you think about physics or mathematics or, or biology, you do, you can create Wonderlands actually, when you do play the meaning. And also what I was reading in the tuning publications, this is also exactly the take uh, here is um, supported, that you need to look at things from different perspectives. When, you, when it comes to critical and creative thinking, it absolutely resonates with the theories that I'm talking about. So my favorite, why is there even like a writing desk, right? I mean, this is like, and then when Alice tries to answer, it's like, well, I don't know the answer, figure it yourself. If you can, will you ever? <laughs> and <laughs> if you are Alice, you know, and I recently I saw one memo mem with the rabbit sitting and, you know, talking to Freud, I think it's like her name was Alice. <laughs> so here you have it. A bit of psychoanalysis everywhere, precisely. And um, in a constant search of meaning, well, I've often seen a cat without a green photo, Alice, but a green without a cat. And I remember I spent like lots of thinking about it, like how it really plays with your thinking. And in this sense, you know, you say, but meaning of what? Well, not necessarily of cat, but of even the way we make a meaning, we, we produce a meaning. So um, a question to all of us. Can we create immersion? Can, pre uh, can immersion be helpful? And can we think a bit along <coughs> the lines of, of the wonderland? And so do but eat cats. One of the questions. And now very shortly, uh, because I was telling you, Maria, that for me half an hour is a killer, okay? Because I want to speed up. Um, a digital no fashion. Worry, we have half an hour, which is one hour. <laughs> but I, we really resonate on that, I see. <laughs> A digital facial image, um, and again, uh, I believe that there could be many million ways, of course, but then I will have to write a trilogy with million volumes of how to teach creativity and criticism online. I have more or less maybe 20 more years to live, so <laughs> maybe I can squeeze in. But um, nonetheless, I had to choose for that article and for that presentation. A uh, digital facial uh, image uh, is a term kind of like coined by Hansen in 2003. And it's not something that it, like, is spread and famous, but basically what he means by that is that he refers to the artwork 
digital artwork when basically a face is used to interact with the viewer. And there have been different digital artworks um, done is the whole article about it. But basically what he's claiming, and he's a bit taking different take on affect um, and disagree a bit with the Luz and Guattari, but nonetheless, I see connections. But the point is that face for all of us is important mean of communication. And at the same time, you know, uh, well, it's been claimed that uh, in a way in neoliberal <coughs> order, you know, we don't look at the body, we look at the face. But that, that face is everywhere. That also like, you know, like the whole body is fascialized in a way. So basically you don't look at the body, you look at the face and how face is constructed in commercials or in advertisements, etc. And um, in a way, Hansen agrees with that, but he uses it a bit differently, saying that face is the is that something. Of course, you can look at the body, but eventually, to communicate, you will look at the face to 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 start discussing or or whatever, right? Any form of interaction. And then he's saying that when the face is digital, and when it's alien, and the uh, then immediately something happens. And this is what he calls affectivity, meaning that you suddenly become affected. He doesn't really say, you know, like, what does it mean? But it basically means that you are affected because you are opening up to something new, to something that is uh, unknown to you. Uh, because we are not used to interact with, uh, and it's, if it's true or not, well, he's not proving it neuroscientifically because he's doing STS, you know, science and technology studies, so it's a different kind of approach. But nonetheless, uh, that's the point. And then, you know, the more kind of the the stranger the interaction is, the the more uh, problematic uh, is the, uh, no, not problematic, I'm sorry, the more intense uh, is uh, the affectivity okay so imagine just to wrap up so we have this kind of a digital face we used to faces but that face um, you know causes that affectivity because it's alien and it's also not acting <laughs> in a predictable ways so basically then he's in this article referring to his own experience that he felt uh, really like eventually like very because the faces were really kind of like indifferent they had a kind of interaction but mostly they were like, uh, well, self-reflexive. So basically not much uh, paying attention to the, to the participant. And then, but nonetheless, he was saying that this affect was really strong. And at the same time that he felt uh, really like ignored or let's say uh, non-important basically or unimportant, right? And then that made me actually think that, and I prolonged that thinking, that because for me that was exactly this encounter um, with the digital face uh, was not only for me as affectivity, but precisely as this affect and concept, because suddenly you really lose a the meaning. There is no longer what you expect from the communication, right? And, but it's not only pure affectivity, there is always some meaning attached to it. So you start producing a meaning of that phase, of that communication, depending on the content of yourself. But again, because for me, the stratum, <coughs> the endurability is so important, then I wouldn't like, if I want to use it in online teaching, if possible, but let's imagine, um, that students will just, you know, leave it and reject it. So that's for me also that moment that the affect and the concept that are created need to produce something. Do you know what I mean? So the meaning can be postponed, it can, it can develop, but nonetheless that it's not something that, oh, you know what I mean? This meaning quite often, that situation when also happens to me when I completely don't get something. Okay, this is all right, but let me just turn it uh, that page and then some appear and then I'm robot, I can help you just click and the mm -hmm. instructions will disappear and I... Exactly, because you are annoyed at some point, right? This is right? a lack of communication with robots. We have a lack of robots in our life, so this is a, it's not yet. Precisely. Uh, yeah. And so, so in this sense, and I'm not saying that now I want to revolutionize those things, but I really love imagining things and daring things. So, so in this sense, I was thinking, you know, like, um, can we actually uh, think about the, and there is a huge conference in New Zealand. I actually send that abstract 
let's see what they will say because it's exactly all the big heads uh, it people coming and talking about it so i'm really curious to see what's cooking what's there because you know sometimes you hear about those high fly things but at the end you have um, not that much tools to use in online uh, teaching. So, um, and I'm not saying like really revolutionize it and I'm not naive and I know how much it will cost, blah, blah, et cetera. But nonetheless, uh, well, if we don't imagine that it will never happen. So uh, in this sense, I was thinking like, can we think about the DEPAO E, uh, you know, um, and, and what kind that could be? And at the same time, you know, so, so that on one hand, you can create that effect and this new meaning with students, help them to kind of like go on with the meaning, but at the same time, will, you know, kind <laughs> of like, again, map the ways of conceptualizing because that's really important, you know, this, this kind of almost like affective thinking, though affective computing is a bit problematic thing, but um, so I'm not now talk about it and, and complex. But at the same time, how we can also incorporate that um, to, uh -huh. and as you said, even not to create this kind of like, okay, just get lost because you annoying me, you know, because th this also quite often happens when I have those things popping up, like, you know, uh, I also tend to switch them off because they're pretty annoying actually. And why they are annoying? Well, there is something to think about and how they can be challenged. So, uh, because I'm also not, not saying that the DFAOE needs to be so developed you know, but it could be those little things that we are talking about, then how to use them so that they will not uh, create the full rejection, right? And then how to incorporate them uh, basically into, um, into thinking uh, no, with online teaching methods, content, etc., in different academic disciplines and uh, with different topics, etc. Because as I said, I know that usually those are humanities, and this is really crucial for me. Those are, um, we have a lot of pedagogical courses that I teach and I'm a student too, because I want to change and, you know, I want to have different perspectives. So I'm becoming student also sometimes to pedagogical courses. And the thing is that in certain disciplines, we have a lot of self-reflection because you need to be self-reflexive when you produce something, right? And this usually happens in humanities and hardly ever in, in, you know, like natural sciences or, you know, the, I like the, the really what we call, right, hard sciences. And I think that this is, uh, it, it should be incorporated because I think that curiosity about something needs to go hand in hand with self-curiosity because you are always kind of like intertwined with, with, the, with the object slash subject of your investigation or production. It's never just there, you know. So, so in this sense, I think that curiosity, self-curiosity, and daring the meaning. That's why I'm saying external and internal sensations uh, of problematizing the meaning. External, so everything that we, you know, perceptually uh, feel from the external world, but also this proprioception from the internal, meaning the feelings, basically. And I'm not talking about why you cry because you cannot finish your essay, but basically those thousand little effects that internally are produced and how we combine them in our knowledge production, you know, that they become a part of what we produce. They do. Uh, because the you cannot just leave the body aside. I mean, like famous, you know, the whole cyberpunk thingy. I'm sorry, I just love talking about those things, you know, the, the dream of disembodiment, 90s, 80s, beautiful science fiction movies, right? And then suddenly Braid Runner, hey, people, we cyborgs, but we feel. Don't forget to feel you have the body. I mean, like, those are really beautiful things in science fiction movies that I think are very good to remember, ethically speaking. So just to finish, um, again, a bit of Wonderland, a bit of um, uh, Lewis Carroll, what kind of DEFA we, uh, digital facial image, we can imagine. So uh, let me read uh, two parts. Uh, imagine, after a pre-recorded lecture, an encounter with the DEFA we, who, like the white rabbit, does not seem to notice or care about you, but who is with you nonetheless, and who leads, um, and who leads uh, though without really leading you. This DEFAWI shows you hidden passages, possibilities, throws you gloves so you can learn to swim in the pool of your own tears and even win an everybody winning cacos race, or leaves you in a room where you realize that there is no room to grow up anymore. 
The DFOI remains indifferent, but interesting, magnetic. You don't want to run away. To the contrary, you want to open the doors which the DFOI is passing by. And if you are too small or too large, there will be ways to reflect, measure, and play with your own size. Or imagine the Hatter-like DFOI just after an online seminar, accidentally freezing time so that little sustaining one habits are engendered only to push the meaning forward. It's always six o'clock now, a bright idea came into Ali's head. Is that the reason so many tea things are put out here? She asked. Yes, that is said the hatter with a sigh. It's always tea time, and we have no time to wash the things between whiles. Then you keep moving run, I suppose, said Alice. Exactly so, said the hatter, as the things get used up. But what happens when you come to the beginning again? Alice ventured to ask. Suppose we change the subject, the March Har interrupted. So what happens when you come to the beginning again? So that was my... Uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.